Hi, and welcome to Extronical, the channel with no mid-rolls, unless YouTube have changed the rules again, which is highly possible and probably maybe they have. Anyway, today we're going to look at this prototype. Roll the titles. Is that it? <sighs> This is something I built nearly 30 years ago, 1993, so 27 years ago or something like that. And it's a prototype. We'll see if you can guess what it does in a bit, but we've got a speaker grill. We've got a couple of sort of input, well, DIN sockets here for whatever they might be for. And we've got a red switch of some sort there, and a couple of dials and what looks like an earphone socket. So, taking off the lid. We can see we've got a small computer system. I'm looking to get uh, a pointing device. And yes, we've got everything that constitutes a computer system. We've got some ROM, we've got an EEPROM here. In fact, I need to put some sellotape over that. This was stored away um, Probably, last, last time this was powered up was about 94, probably. But we've got an EEPROM, we've got some RAM, which is, I'm trying to remember, that this is a 64K EEPROM. And this is 6264, that's going to be 64 kilobits. So kilobits, so divide by 8, so that's going to be 8 kilobyte of RAM. We've got... The venerable, we can move the cable out of the way, we'll just disconnect that for a minute. We've got the venerable 6502 microprocessor, or the 65CO2 version here. Had a couple of extra uh, opcodes or so in the C version, if I remember correctly. Or was that the Rockwell version that, that had the extra commands in? I think it was the C version. Let's pop that back on. In fact, no, I'll leave it off. We've got lots of lots of decoding logic and you can see it's uh, all been put together with a lot of all the buses and everything are just wired together with the shortest run of wire I could. I actually, before I opened this up uh, yesterday when I found it in the attic and I was looking for something else, as you do, I could have sworn I'd wire wrapped this. But obviously the passage of 20 odd years before I've last, since I've last looked at it, uh, I hadn't wire wrapped it. I've literally just got some big piece of strip board and we've wired it up with these cables here. So I think I've gone for grey for, for signals and data buses are grey. Anything that's orange, I don't know why I didn't have red at the time, but anything orange is just power lines and black are obviously ground lines as well. So yeah, we've got a lot of decoding logic here for the various bits and bobs on the board. These are, I think, transceivers. Are there 275? Let's get my magnifying glass. So just slightly off your camera, I've got my magnifying glass. These are two four fives yeah they're bus transceivers so they're tri-state devices they are they can accept they can send data out they can buffer data out buffer data in or go into high state and so there's no actual or they can go into high impedance state so they're not driving the bus at all so they'll be going straight onto the probably the data bus yeah these will be onto the data bus of the 6502 there's two of them did i need to buffer the address bus you wouldn't normally buffer the address bus unless something else was also driving and then you need like a bus control so I, I can't remember why I've got to. I've got the circuit diagram, I'll show you that later. I've got all the documentation for this. So what else have we got? So yeah, logic chips, which obviously you would fit onto one single uncommitted logic array back in the day. But when you're prototyping, you actually just go for the actual logic chips. What have we got over here? We've got uh, a little, ah, uh, it's a 5555. I'll explain what that does in a minute. So what else have we got? We've got the processor, the ROM, we've got the RAM. We've got a serial, RS-232, or is it RS-2245 or something? It definitely does RS-232 compatible serial chip. We've got the MAX32, was it 232? Which is basically a, a buffer for that chip to convert to the correct voltages, if I remember correctly. So this is the this handles, handles the serial communications, and this is sort of the buffer to the outside world. I can see that's going up to this, probably this connector as well, which then goes to that DIN plug on the outside. So that was our sort of DIN plug for the serial interface on the outside. 
On the other DIN plug, we've got power actually coming in. So it's just a power connector and it's totally overused for two wires, but it's probably one I had in some apartment at the time. So I just whack that on. We'll power this up shortly and we'll see what it does. I did power it up earlier and it still functions, which I was shocked when I found out when I noticed that I didn't have anything covering this. But it has had the lid on and be stored in a box in a mostly dark place for the last 26 years. But I do need to put some sellotape, some sort of like covering over there shortly. What else we've got to give you some clues? We have, it says GPS there, but I'm pretty sure it's not GPS. It's uh, ZN429E-8. Now I know what this part of this circuitry is doing. So that I'll tell you is a DAC, a digital to analog converter. And if you follow my channel, I've had a lot of projects and things that I do with sound. You can see that even back in the early nineties, I was messing about with DACs and things and sound even back then. And then at the end of here, we've got a 386, an Allen 386, which is uh, basically uh, a simple op amp. Just a simple op amp. Uh, we've got a few like filtering caps and things like that. These electrical tits, and even after all these years, they don't seem to, well, they're working. Nothing's bulged or blown up, but they are fairly low voltage ones as well. And when you see all these little small capacitors on these when you're designing uh, computer circuits, these technically are probably a bit overkill, but these act as little reservoirs. You'll find one near every chip on this board. So no matter where we go, you'll find one on every, next to every little chip. And it's going to cost across the power and ground. Helps to stop any little bit of voltage dips as different parts of the circuit are putting demands on the power. So what do you think it does? We've got the speaker. We've got the op amp. We've got a DAC. You're going to say it's something to do with sort of like sending music out or digital sound of some sort. And yes, you are correct. In fact, when we power it up in a minute, you'll hear my voice from back uh, probably 94, I think, when I recorded this. But what this was, so I should explain this as well. But these are two crystals, one for driving the clock for the processor and the main, buffer uh, main computer chips here. Uh, this one, I'm trying to remember what it is, I think, is for the serial to drive that at the correct speed. It's just that I would have thought I would have put that over there. Uh, none of the wire seems to go over there. But I would think that was somehow rooted to that, although I could be wrong and I can't remember. I have to get the schematic out shortly. So what this does, or was designed to do, was a text, a text to speech system. And obviously nowadays, modern computers caught with it quite easily. In fact, uh, back in the 90s, they'd have caught with it from the mid-90s onwards quite easily, I would say. Possibly even from some of the earliest 90s. This was designed as my university project to connect to old, lower-powered systems. Obviously not with all this amount of chips. You scale this down to, like, as I said, one uh, uncommitted logic array you do. It's basically like a CPLD or a FPGA gate that, uh, chip that we have now. So it would be simplified a lot, but it was just a university design prototype that I did as part of my university course. So the idea was you would send text over the serial link, the processor would get that. So that'd be text, like, so maybe the lazy fox jumped over the, well, it's not the lazy fox, is it? The quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog or something. Whatever you sent across as words, this would look at the words work out which phonemes to use, which are those sound parts of words. These will be stored digitally. The phonemes would have been stored digitally. And then it not it wouldn't just bolt them together. It wouldn't just bolt different phonemes together. It doesn't always work. It would blend them together to give them much more natural speech. And then it would play out those sounds back through the buffer. And this would happen rapidly. As the text would be sent over as, you know, just a few sentences, a few words. We could be sent over really quick because it's only a few characters. This, because its sole job is to do the decoding of text and plain of sign, would also do it really quick. So it took the burden off the other slower computers of the time of the late 80s, early 90s that were still knocking about, particularly in the UK, which had spectrums and things. And admittedly, this was more of a design exercise for me. Building a computer system was what I wanted to do. It had to have a function, so its function was text-to-speech. So one of the things I know I've got stored on here 
is some words I spoke. So it can play as well, those as well. As well as doing text to speech, obviously, because it can play digitized sign back, you can store a digitized sign in the CPROM and play it back just raw, like I've done on lots of my projects. So when I power it up in a, in a, in a minute, we'll turn that back over that way. You'll hear my voice from, I think, somewhere in the mid, right about March, April, May, something like that, of 1994. So 26 year, over 26 years ago, my voice has been sat, sitting on here, waiting to be played again. I know it works, so we're not going to be disappointed with that, because I have actually already tried it. So I just need to get a power supply and connect it up. And Oh, one more thing. You notice there's two dials on the front here. So we had two dials, you remember, at the end. One is the volume, and that's the one I've unplugged, so I need to plug that back in. You can see it's going near to the op amp, so yeah, it's altering the volume directly uh, when it's an analog signal. The other one goes to this 555 timer. So we've got a classic um, 555 being used as basically on off, on off. It's generating a clock pulse, basically, but not for the processor. That's done with a much more accurate crystal clock there. It's generating a clock pulse that is fed to the 6502's interrupt pin. It has, on the 6502 it has two interrupt pins, maskable and non-maskable. I think I probably would have gone for maskable interrupt because it didn't really make, make any difference in this scenario. You ought to know the difference, have a quick Google. So yeah, we've got a classic capacitor and resistor divider circuit here. And this alters the resistor value, which then speeds or slows down the interrupts, which means the sound can be altered in real time to speed up or slow down. More of a bit of fun that. I knew I could do it and it would be simple, so I implemented it. So let's get the power supply, hook it up, and I'll and you can listen to my voice and I'll be highly embarrassed because my voice sounds quite a bit different when I was, you can obviously tell I was quite young at the time. Okay, that's connected up. I've set my power supply to, um, I'm gonna look, quick look now, 6.9 volts. And that will be brought down to 5 volts because it's every chip on here is a 5 volt chip. Oh, with the exception of, oh, I've got to, I, mean, I am going back 20, nearly 30 years to remember this stuff. I think the RS232 needed a negative voltage to function. I'm not sure how I generated that. I think the op amp ideally wanted one, but I think you could run it from 0 to 5 volts, so I think I did. Anyway, so I may have even not generated the negative voltage at this point in the circuit. So we're all connected up, got it set to 6.9 volts. We've got a voltage regulator right over here. You think that you think that would be near to where the power is. But I was, I don't know, probably short of board space or something. I'm not quite sure. It's a bit, I mean, it's right over here. This is the 5 volt regulator. It'll be, let's just get my magnifying glass out again. To be a 7805, I'd be very surprised if it wasn't. Yeah. 7805, 78S05, I think it said on there. And these are just a, a, a simple, cheap, linear regulator. So I've got my power pack set to 6.9, that'll drop it down to 5 volts. How we get the power over here to do that from there, I don't know, I must be running a wire underneath the board maybe as well. Got a bit of cardboard here as well, you probably can't notice it on camera. This is actually a piece of cardboard that's on there. It's obviously protecting it from the metal case for this board. So let's power on, and I'm not sure what the speed or volume settings are set at. Might need to adjust them as we go along. Yes, that's set to a really low speed, so we'll speed that up, turn the the pitch up, which is this control here, which will send quick more interrupts through 6502, and the sound will play back quicker. Tell how young I sound. Text to speech module is operating at 10 kilohertz. This is the volume. If I turn up too much, it will top out, but I'll keep turning till it tops out. Text to speech module is operating at 10 Yeah, it's breaking up there. Text to speech module is operating at 10 kilohertz. So I'll turn the pitch right up so you can hear me squeak like a mouse. Speech module is operating at 10. And that's as high as it's going. Text 
to speech module is operating at 10 kilohertz. So, annoyingly, the, there's no default to say play back at the, at the original kilohertz. speed. You've, you've got to get it on this. And I wish I'd set it so that I could have a switch or press something to play back at the original speed. So I'm not quite sure how my voice exactly sounded because which one of these pitch controls, which one of these is correct when I turn it? Let's turn it down a bit more. The speech module is operating at 10 kilohertz. See, that sounds too slow. The speech module is operating at 10 kilohertz. That sounds about right for what I can make my voice sound like. module is operating at 10 kilohertz. So I'm, it says it's operating at 10 kilohertz. What I want to do, the red button that we saw on the front earlier is actually a reset button. It connects directly to, well, I'm saying it connects directly to the reset of the processor. It kind of does. There's a bit of reset circuitry, which I think is this capacitor and resistor here. It's near-ish anyway. If you remember the Design 6502, I think it had a simple capacitor resistor near the reset circuit. I know there was a problem with that when I wrote, when I actually designed this, I'll talk about that. So if I hold this reset in, it should stop it talking. There we go. And if I let go, it in. Now that had a problem, I admitted a design error with the reset circuitry, I can remember it, uh, and the processor just wouldn't boot, I brought software to test it, and I'll talk about how I designed and tested this in a few minutes, in, in a short while. But when I first got the processor got on there, got some ROM, I'd written a simple program. It's probably to flash an LED as they often are. Uh, I had the reset button there. And there was a design issue with this reset circuitry. And because I sold everything up, I couldn't be bothered trying to change it. I actually managed to be able to get around it in software. So when you plugged it in, you powered it up, it all worked, which was one of my initial tests. I didn't wire all this up and then test it, by the way. There was a, a structure to how I built and tested this. I powered it up, from from cold start, it would work from putting your power in. But if you pressed to the reset button, to it would hang, and it wouldn't work then anymore. The minute you press the reset button, it would hang. And what was happening, if I remember rightly, the edge, so when you when this resets, and it, and it resets the processor on a reset pin, I think the edge of the, ah, remember now, what it was, the switch was doing debounce. I hadn't, I hadn't debounced the switch. So switches need debounce because when you press a mechanical switch, you think it's just connected simply and when it let go, it disconnects simply. It doesn't. The metal are touching, it's like it's bouncing off the surface, causing multiple ons and offs. And this would actually cause a problem. These multiple resets on that pin as that switch bounce was cause problems. Now you can debounce switches with a capacitor and for whatever reason, I thought I can't be bothered. And so actually, in software, I managed to do something, so, and I can't remember for life of me what it was, where it would start the reset procedure, and I would set the processor running in a loop for, a, I don't know, a few tens of seconds or something, and then I would come out. So yeah, when it first got the initial reset, what I then did, I remember now, I remember when I, I mean, bear in mind, I'm going back a lot. When it gets the initial reset, the processor immediately stops further resets from happening because you can mask the reset in software. So I'm on the 6502. So I masked the reset so I couldn't get any further resets to this processor. So a further bouncing of this switch would not continue reset it. It was reset. I stopped the reset happening, went into a loop that waited for, I don't know, probably two, two or three tenths of a second or something. And then I released that reset. And by that time, the user has released the button. And it would then reset, and then it would carry on normally, like getting multiple resets. So that's an example of sometimes fixing things in software afterwards. So we'll just switch the power off to this, and we'll just disconnect the power from the power supply. So you can see it looks reasonably complicated, and it was. When I built this, my and it did build and work almost right away. I only had a couple of glitches, like I just mentioned, the reset was an issue and that was a very late design. That was one of the last things I built onto this. So I just fixed that in software. But when I built this, I, if, you look, if you look, everything's socketed. Oh, and the EEPROM's in a zero, inf a ZIF socket, a zero inversion, in easy for me not to say it, a zero insertion for a socket. So we pop the lead up like that, and that would then go into an EEPROM programmer. 
and I program it and add a, an ultraviolet eraser because that's what it needs when you're actually erasing them. I'll pop that back down and that locks the pins in place. So I can't remember exactly what I did, but roughly at the time I would, I think I wired up obviously the 6502 probably first, probably the ZIF socket got sold in as well. I would then have connected up the buses and then I literally, literally did continuity checks for each of the sockets. I would go via the pin, so if this was say D0 for data bus bit zero, I would check that on this. I would check for continuity, I would check that there were no shorts, so I check other pins as well that were nearby. And, that's, and it was a slow process, but it, it proved worthwhile because it did literally almost work first time. So I'd do that, do that, put the RAM chip in, wire up the bus for the RAM chip, check continuity again, did all the, uh, all the logic gates and uh, all the logic chips. And you can see it's bus after bus. These are probably going to be his data and address buses all around here. I mean, address bus on the 6502 is 16 bits and 8 bit data bus. That's a lot of wires. You may say, well, I build my own circuit board. The facilities for me to do that easily were not there and accurately. It was not, especially on this sort of size circuit board. So it was easy to build on street board and do it this way. And so I did all that, checking continuity, continuity, etc. And then when it came to firing it up, I'll have had the 6502, I'd have had the ROM chip, I'd have had a simple LED, probably locked onto one of these gates, something. And I would have been writing some code and checking out a logic probe at the time, don't have now actually. And I'd have been checking data and address buses to make sure it seemed that the 6502, the, the 6502's heart was ticking. And yeah, it did, first time, if I remember correctly. And then I would have added the RAM, and some of these support chips. The next bit would have been the digital analog for interface because then I can't get sounds out. And later on, I would have added the pitch control and the volume as well would have been added as well at a much, much later stage in the final parts of it, making sure everything else was working. So I never did finish it completely. I never did it so it did the text to speech thing. It just stopped that digitized sound. That's as far as I got with it. And then it got stored away. I finished at university and I moved on. One of the other problems I did have, everything's, everything worked, the processor was ticking over nicely, it was executing code, I could send digital code, digital numbers to the analog to con digital converter and that would all work and get the right voltages out, that would all been tested and working. And then I came to actually put the sample speech in and I used a much more uh, powerful piece, powerful computer at the time to record the speech and digitize it. Uh, eight bit speech, obviously, like I did with my first ever ESP32 DAC audio project that was eight bit based sound. I sent the eight bit sound to the DAC, to the circuitry, and I got absolute garbled, horrendous sound out. And it didn't actually take me that long to suss what was going on, but maybe an hour or two thinking about it, looking at thinking about sound waves realized, I mean, you want to admit I was a lot younger then, I realized that the sound, the digitized sound was a signed byte. So it had a value it could be plus 128 or minus 127. But the way my circuitry was working here, it was not, it was not, it could not handle sound bytes. The value had to be, the value had to be between zero and 255. So that was like, well, I can't change the circuitry now, it was all built in here. So, but all I had to do was to actually convert those signed integers to a range, instead of being minus 127 to plus 128, I had to move into a range zero to 255. As long as the waveform was the same, whether it was above the zero line or, you know, around the half, or, or it was built around the halfway point, it was irrelevant. So all I had to do was add 127 wouldn't it have been to every single value before I pumped it out and I didn't do that on here or did I did I do that in software can't remember I probably did it on the actual horse computer I would have added the numbers on on the horse computer to bring it into the range so imagine it was at minus 127 adding 127 would put it to zero minus 126 would put it to one etc so let's have a quick look at the right if I did for this pop that away Oh, got a bit of black sellotape randomly from somewhere, which I am guessing actually, I think that was probably supposed to be on there and that's just fell off somewhere and got stuck in there over the years. 
Aha, because that fits far too perfectly with wires and everything to not be going there. Let's find that in the lid. Cool. I don't think EEPROMs last forever, even if you do hide them from ultraviolet light. I don't show how many years they've got before it'll probably be gone forever and I'd have to reprogram it. I don't I don't even have the program anymore to do that. I know I think you can buy them online now that do all sorts of EEPROMs. I had a really old fashioned one that connected over a serial interface to a, another computer. Uh, we'll just get this uh, to another computer and I program it that way and had a little ultraviolet eraser for him. All that equipment's gone now, I don't have that. It was thrown out many years ago in the days before there was any nostalgia for old computers or anything all like that. And now I wish I had the old kit. But anyway, I need to get back into work, messing about with some old computers as well, I think. it's uh, I find it a lot of fun. Right, so I'm just going to check I've got no personal information on there. Yes, there is. So let's just turn over the first page or two. So, contents page. And... And you see, it's a, we've got the hardware report, there's going to be a circuit diagram in here, talking about the interrupt enable, clock generators, decoding logic, replay control, uh, report on the software, you can see that I've got things like um, converting, converting the words to phonemes, I would guess that was, extract word, well we can look it up, so convert it on page 37 I think, quick look to page 37, see exactly what that is. Route, well, let's see what that routine did. So I wrote a lot of the software, just not finalised it all. So, okay, on entry, stack pointer, plus zero, comma, one, is going to, I'm not sure, but anyway, some sort of memory location is going to be pointing to the ASCII string to work on. And we we'll probably, I'll probably explain SP1 somewhere else in this documentation. I'm not sure whether it's, Stack, I don't think that's going to be stack, it's not going to be stack, it's going to be some sort of memory that uh, I've allocated there that this will work on for convert. Pointer to the rule database, the rule of decoding signs, the characters to match. So it gives an example, ask if you send in the word people, search string or rule data points to the rules for letter O. So it's like it's going through scanning for rules and that will result, would be, instead of being O sound, it's going to come out with the E sound. For that particular rule there for people, for people. So where E is a phonetic sign or E for E O. All registers in the 6502 preserved on exit. So yeah, we've got timing calculations. Let's have a flip through. So hardware report, problems, price fee, the, the, the reason for this project being Talking about the fact that 6502 has got two interrupt pins using a 555. Various problems I've got here that I've had to solve with that. Block diagram done in probably paint. Certainly looks like it could have been paint that was written, it was done in. So block diagram there. Explanations was on. Uh, all the ICs on the in the actual circuit are all listed here and what they are. Triple three input, no. Uh, the ROM was a right because I haven't looked at it. I actually generally haven't opened this documentation before this shooting this video now. The box of tricks, my project I had, and I powered it up. I knew that was working out. That I had, this I haven't. So we're talking about the tri-state buffers, buffers, which I've got four of them. Wow. And of course there'd be more than one. Because if, for example, the serial interface would need to be isolated from the RAM the DAC and the RS232 interface. Now that makes sense. I didn't realize what I need, nor why I needed four at the time. And ROM, that should be 64. Yep, yeah, 64K, 8K for the RAM. So the bottom 8K of the ROM would be unavailable. It's mapped out using the logic, can't access it. Serial interface, 685. Oh, yep. Yeah. So we'll flip through this quickly. Decoding logic, synchronization logic. I haven't looked at this in yeah, the best part of nearly 30 years. And then we've got timing considerations. So phase one and phase two clock of the 6502. In opposite phases, we've got phase one and phase two clock is exactly opposite if you look. And we should have some more timing diagrams, I would have thought. 
But this is how you're going to make sure you're going to make sure that you've put in something out on the address bus and 6502 is waiting for it to come back in. You've got to be able to deliver that data onto the data bus, ready for when it wants to look at the data bus. And you've got to make sure you get chips that are fast enough to do that. And that's when all these timing diagrams come in. So I'm talking about the speed I need. So I need to be able to de uh, buffer. I'm talking about timing, sorry. So I was saying that the uh, dress buffering, this, the 245, LS245 tri-state buffers, will take 10 nanoseconds to switch. The decoding logic for my decoding chips, which was these. So basically all this malarkey here, most of it is some decoding over there, I think as well. But most of the decoding logic, as it goes through these various not, or gates, nor gates, I've timed that out, I've calculated the worst case scenario before they've managed to do that. And the worst case scenario was apparently 50 nanoseconds on that. Uh, and then 250 nanoseconds for the ROM to respond. And then some data bus buffering, 10 nanoseconds. So I work all that out, giving a total of 320 nanoseconds before I can get the data onto the data bus that the 6502 is waiting for. And that proves that's enough, that's within spec. I'll probably say it down there, what I need. And I go on and talk about my timing calculations again. So let's have a look. Software report. I'm not going to look at these things, but various design diagrams. Manual pages. So all the routines that are written to handle the code are all here. Convert, whatever, insert, whatever that does. Replace specials. I'd gone to quite a lot of effort in writing all this code. Strict morphemes. I know it's speed, spin through that. We don't look, need to look at the evaluations. I'm not bothered about that. Speech pronunciation, we'll skip. And then we have appendices. So, list of all phonemes for the uh, English language. Version rules, talk about what it's going to match. If it sees a pound, it's probably going to pronounce it as a pound or something like that. So the memory map, you can see 64K, our ROM is from the 8K to the upper, and then we've got zero page, which is really a bit special on the 6502, we'll talk about that in a minute. And we've got the, the mapping for the 6850, transmit receive register and controller status register. All this had to be decoded out in that decoding object, so we could write to these registers, etc. Uh, not committed, reflection 6850P, so I haven't done enough decoding logic to bother access to bother separating that out so this is a reflection of that and then we get into the ram so we've got some workspace areas and then buffers for the rs232 and sound output so on a 6502 they have this first 256 bytes is referred to as zero page and it's incredibly important because you can access that and write that much much faster than any other memory location in this entire memory mop, map not mop map whether it's RAM or ROM or whatever it is. When it's trying to access zero page, internally, it knows it only has to assemble an eight bit address and it just puts all the other bits on the high part of the bus to zero. And that just saves a cycle or two. And if you've got some tight routines, particularly if you're a games coder back in the day, that would be incredibly important. So this was a highly prized area of memory, making things work fast on 6502, which meant actually the hardware vectors here uh, where the 6502 would go to, and it's expecting ROM to be up here, to actually know where to start booting in your program area. So it would go to some hardware vectors here. You can see there's um, six used. So two bytes for the address of startup, two bytes for the non masculine interrupt, and two bytes for the hour queue. So on startup, the 6502 will get the first two bytes at the very, very top of memory, take them, and that's the address it's going to start executing to see where it starts and boots up. So let's see if we can find the circuit diagram. Here we go. So we've got the entire circuit diagram. 6502, tri-state buffers, if I remember, yep, two, three, four, and five are the tri-state buffers, and your various logic decoding here. So this is all done as gates, we've got the no gates, and gates, <coughs> excuse me, uh, not gates, all decoding down to the various things. So we've got the RAM, the ROM, clock. So what was that other clocks used for? 
Where is that other clock? The clock's up here. Ah, that is the 65. This one is the 6502 clock. Going into the phase what phase zero clock, 6502 pin. This clock is going, yes, it's going to the serial. I wasn't sure at the time, it's going to the serial. So that's a clock for the serial interface to make sure the serial will receive and send data at the correct rate. Can't remember what that is, but it'll sit on there. I might need, I actually, ha, this was hand drawn and hand written on. And I'll take some close up photos as well, so you're probably looking at them now. But all these little numbers were hand put in at the time. Incredibly tiny. At this scale, on this A3 size piece of paper, I did this by hand at this tiny amount. I had fantastic eyesight back then, and I, I had a pencil that I used to sharpen with a very fine sandpaper. These will have been stencils. And that's it really, got all the decoding logic, uh, the pitch control, as I've already mentioned there. Yeah, that was the design that I then built into that. There are no changes. What's on here went into there. And a log of generally where things might have gone. And it's random. All the things that are in there. Ah, here we are, software. So let's have a quick look at the software. Hardware test three. Right, listings. Ah, and a lovely. Ooh, let's have a look. Is this dot matrix or is it daisy wheel? I need to get, um, and I can't remember. Let's get my, no, that's dot matrix. I can see the little, not pixels, but I can see the little build up of the points. Dot matrix. I couldn't remember what it was at the time. Hardware test one, so a very simple test. Test the hardware. Hardware test two, testing. NMI circuitry, RAM presence, DAC circuits, including the amp. Hardware test three, to detect to replace pre-sampled signs. Uses only nearly all of the ROM, uh, and because at 10 kilohertz, even five seconds would be in 50K. So yeah, would need nearly all of the ROM. And yeah, there's the core for that. Test that. Hardware test five, what happened to hardware test four? I don't know if that somewhere. Testing the serial interface. Don't remember coding that. Obviously I did. And I've got some personal details on there, so they'll be blank tight that you're currently seeing. And I think this is the final code. But I just never completely implemented it. I think it was almost implemented. You can see it's so there's the convert word, call in more routines, strip more things. So yeah, the convert word looks like it's converting to lowercase first. Stripping primary punctuation, strip more things, strip check exception, strip periods, uh, and then convert the word to phonemes. And I've got to remember some of my 6502 here now. Pull the processor flags, is that PLP pull the processor flags? PHA is push accumulator. So I've got to go here for last one. I think that's push processor flags, push the accumulator. This is all going onto the stack. Transfer the X to the accumulator. Ah, so let's start from here. Push the accumulator. So we've saved the accumulator so we can get over it by any of these routines. We put the Y into the accumulator, pushing that. So we're transferring, pushing the Y to the stack, pushing the X to the stack, and pushing the processor flags. That's what that is. I used to do a lot of 6502 programming, programming back in the day, a heck of a lot. So yeah, it looks reasonably sized. We can see there's a lot of code there. Yeah, I've, it looks to be honest to be finished. But I'm, I know it wasn't. It must have been very close to being completely finished. It looks like there's a reason amount of data in there. Anyway, that's it for that. I know it's a little bit different from my usual content, but that's just because I've been incredibly busy with work over this last month. Have you noticed the videos kind of came to a grinding halt? I'm working uh, many hours and obviously you've got your family as well, family life to balance for that as well. So working on what I want to do software wise for my channel has not happened. So I just wanted to get out something a bit more different that was quick and easy for me to shoot without any actual coding. So it just took me the time to shoot this and an hour or so to 
just edit the video down. Okay, so that's it for now. Thanks very much for watching, if you've, especially if you've watched to the end of this video, which is a little bit different from my channel. So I appreciate that if you have. Thumbs up if you liked it. Thanks very much for my patrons who still subscribe to me and patronise me and patronise me despite the lack of content sometimes. And thank you very much for watching.